Um, so General Convention is our governing body of the church. Um, yes, on an individual basis, you know, our, our bishops are, are, what's that? Yes, that is it. Thank you. Um, as Episcopalians, we have a certain accountability to our particular bishops. That is the person who leads our diocese. And yes, our presiding bishop has a certain authority over the whole church. Um, however, General Convention is the, the ultimate leadership organization that charts everything from how our prayer books are written to, to what we, how we uh, frames our, our advocacy in the, uh, in the civic space. Uh, to what kind of employee policies are required, certainly of the national church itself, but in some cases how we as individual churches and cathedrals. Essentially, this is <clears throat> how we order our common life. When I, when I, I may once or twice refer to DFMS, that is the Domestic and Foreign Missionary Society of the Episcopal Church, that has essentially been our name since the late 1700s when we were created. Uh, and that is, and it's actually in the first few pages of the prayer book. That is, that is kind of who we are. So we are a domestic and foreign missionary society that just happens to have a bunch of old buildings where we, uh, you know, from which we do our work. Um, what's that? Yeah, it kind of is, right? It, it is. Um, we, we gather every three years in convention. Um, this time it's been four because last year the pandemic said we, we postponed it. Each diocese, first of all, all bishops, it is a bicameral uh, uh, system of governance. No coincidence, it was formed, I believe, in the same year as our U.S. Constitution. Um, and so, and I, I am going in the fall, I'm going to be doing a very exciting class on Episcopal polity. And I'll explain some of why, how all the convention stuff works, but I'm doing it in the spirit of explaining why, how this relates to our election of a bishop. So in the Episcopal Church, we, um, our, we as our, Episcop our, our diocesan canons are not independent of the national canons and the national structure. Um, oh, there's a camera. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not feeling free right now after my <laughs> sermon. <laughs> um, we and and essentially when we send di when we send deputies. So deputies is the one house, House of Deputies. That is lay people and clerk and priests and deacons. Then you have the House of Bishops. Something you can imagine. There is now a legislative process, much like Senate and. Um, <clears throat> and the House of Representatives, something has to be approved by both, um, by both houses in order to become official, excuse me. Um, when we, and we obviously all bishops are members of the House of Bishops uh, and all, di each diocese elects uh, delegates and alternates roughly about a year and a half before when the convention happens. They are a ton of work and preparation. Typically, okay, we have uh, some people who have been, raise your hand if you have been there before. Okay, so we have three people who have been here before. Richard is currently a deputy to General Convention, so if you really want someone to share your opinion with someone who is going to be voting, those two thumbs are hot hands because those are voting hands in our national structure. Um, some things that, are, this is a shorter time they have because once again because of covid concerns they have abbreviated from what is it like 11 days to four what is it 14 from 14 days to seven days that means <laughs> that means um you know that and let me also explain this is um any general convention is committee heavy there is a lot of work Imagine this. People don't just show up every three years and say, let's run things, right? There is a great deal of preparation and work and committee work that happens in between conventions that then they then will present um, uh, recommendations, resolutions, and such. So anything we see that gets to the floor, there's been a lot of work that goes into it. And then 
there is an org a body that kind of carries the governance in the middle times, and that's executive council. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of a picture of how a lot of these things come together, which I'll be talking about. I want to say one thing. I have never been to general convention. What I am giving you is not the work of deep journalism. There are about a thousand resolutions that come up every once in a while. I'm trying to pick some things that I thought would be interesting, some things that are going to be obviously on our minds. Um, so I think one thing, because it's a shortened convention, um, there's probably things that in another convention might get more conversation, but they might say, because we can't do it justice, we're going to postpone it to a later convention. But even those things have had a lot of work going into it. Um, I think what I'm generally going to do, because I'm going to hit on 10 plus things, uh, I think generally I'm going to kind of move through it, and then if there are some clarifying questions, and I'm sure those will come up, those will be good, and then we'll have time at the end for a little, you know, for for conversation on all of it as well. So I'm going to do my best to kind of plug on through it. Now, one of the most kind of interesting things to us here in Ohio is we'll be looking for a new um, president and vice president of the House of Deputies. That is a is it three term maximum? Is that how it works? And Gay Jennings, who who is uh, a priest in the diocese of Ohio, was a canon here for the the diocese not so many years ago. And many of y'all may have, may know her through her work here, uh, is going to be moving on. Um, and so we'll be electing a new uh, president and a new vice president of the House of Deputies. It is not time to elect a new presiding bishop. Bishop Curry has a few more years left in his term, but it is time, and there's already been a committee that is formed to start discerning who some of the appropriate candidates might be. That will happen. I think that's going to be happen the next convention, yeah. and they go into conclave. They really do, like the whole you know white smoke thing, where they all kind of hot, go out in, in the bishops get together and elect from their own order um, who the next presiding bishop is going to be. Now, I would also say, wh where do we learn about this stuff? Um, there are some good blogs out there. I uh, Seven Whole Days by Scott Gunn, who leads Forward Movement, is a really good blog. House of Deputies News is also a good resource. Um, that's uh, uh, as much of that is written by Jim Naughton, who is also a part of the Diocese of Ohio. Um, you know, we're, we're kind of connected in a few ways. Um, but, but but those are also good sources. If I say something that is, each thing I'm going to talk about are things I know some things about. But each time there are committees, there are lots of people who put vast amounts of work into it. Uh, and so there are ways of getting you connected with um, the deeper story. And I'll do my best to let you know where I get my information. Also, follow, um, uh, you can follow the uh, Episcopal News Service, which will tend to give you a pretty good overview. Um, I would say, I was about to say, I would be careful with Twitter. I mean, Twitter is good information, but you're always going to, you're going to get, um, you're not going to get the whole picture. You're going to get, you know, whoever you're following. I'll be following that, but be aware that that's an imperfect vehicle. We're generally talking about things that require a lot of thought, a lot of discernment, a lot of prayer, and that hot takes in 140 characters is not going to get at the depth of that but it can give you a good sense of what's going on on the floor. And in fact, there's been, I think in Catherine Jefford Shorey, la her last year, I think she really kind of struggled with inviting people in convention to be in convention and not just live tweeting the whole thing because that sometimes can make for a, a difficult <laughs> legislative conversation. Somebody leaked out of the House of Bishops. What's that now? That's right. Somebody, what was that about? Bishop who I will not name leaked to Padre Alberto the election of the presiding of, that Michael Curry was elected before it was used to the House of Deputies. Oh. And so they had an executive right. session uh, meeting where they all talked about it. So, so bishops <laughs> are no better, and that's an important thing. To bear in mind. All right, with that preamble, and you have a little, but I, but I will say it probably will be good theater for the, you know, the time. What days are they? The July seventh. So like Thursday through Thursday, essentially. It's, uh, it's the eighth through the eleventh. 
Okay. Because the days were actually in session. This is Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Okay. Pray for my sanity. We will pray for your sanity. Uh, so again, but Episcopal News Service does tend to give a pretty good overview of what's going on. All right. So it will be live cast. Yes. It will be live. Oh, right, of course. Nowadays, everything is good in live cast. Uh, yeah. All right. So with that, we're going to move into our top 10. And my first one is actually 10.5 because as of 24 hours ago, it is not really in play. And that is the question of baptism and communion. Now, I'll give you a little bit of explanation in terms of where this is coming from and what the, you know, what the backstory is. I know this is one that we've talked about in here. Uh, essentially, and this, I learned this from the... Um, uh, House of Deputies news. So Jim Naughton wrote this. So if you want to, if you go to that article, you'll get a pretty good perspective on what, where this came from, what the recent history is. Um, essentially, the legislative committee that is looking this at this has decided not to take any action, which I presume to mean that it, it doesn't. This, those of you who have been there, does that mean it wouldn't come up on the floor? Like if a committee says we're not going to take action, we're not going to take action on it. Okay, so let me just sort of get to what, you know, the question is, is our, um, you know, are people who have not been baptized able to come forward to receive communion? The background is to look to the 1979 prayer book, which was the, which was the fruition of looking at the liturgical movement, the ecumenical movement, going back to the, the practices of the early church. And they realized, and, and the other part of this is it was a realization in the late 60s and early 70s that the Episcopal church was no longer going to be at the center of culture for much longer. You know, and that certainly came true. And one of the guiding questions that shaped that new prayer book was, Okay, wh who are we? What is our defining, um, you know, what is our defining identity? And they found through their work in the liturgical movement, looking to the ancient church, looking to where sibling churches, was it was really baptism. And that baptism, and that very much shapes our, we call it a baptismal ecclesiology, the book of, the 79 book of common prayer, which also made Eucharist, so the high value of Eucharist, which also made Holy Eucharist, the uh, the weekly practice. How many remember before that time? I, okay, I can't go back that time because I wasn't in the Episcopal Church before that. But it very much is around the idea that you know baptism is is what binds us together. And in the, doing that, they said you know before that the canons had said you couldn't receive communion unless you were no confirmed. And so they said. Wait, whoa, 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 that is wrong. That is, you know, that is institutional church kind of putting, their, putting that forward. Um, and so they changed it. And the canon in 1979 that was, well, actually, I don't know when that canon was created, was no unbaptized person shall receive communion. Now, we can certainly argue about whether that's unnecessarily negative, but basically the conversation comes down to, one, do we need to adopt a more inclusive stance? Is that, is that something limiting if we say that baptism is a requirement for communion? Or are we, is, that a sufficient, is that a significant breakaway by, by essentially um, uh, breaking the connection between communion and, and baptism, right? If our, church, if our prayer book is on a baptismal ecclesiology, if, we are, if we're rooting our action on the baptismal covenant, what happens if through our canons we say that baptism is, is discretionary or, or not something that's vital to the part of it? That's kind of where I think a lot of the conversation lies, and that is probably why what really happened is this got to, this got to the committee, and it's going to be a committee made up of deputies, which is lay people, clergy, and bishops, uh, who declined to take action on it. And if I read it correctly, they really were not inclined to take, you know, to support this. And if anything, it would have been put to set to put it to the floor, as in order to bring up the conversation and to say no, we don't think that this is an appropriate thing for our church because it would significantly um, recast something that is at the heart of how our ecclesiology, how our prayer book is, how how we are as a church. Um, 
But the thing is, it's not really, um, and uh, in 2012, there is a recent history to this, 2012, the Diocese of North Carolina, I was in that convention that sent it, I can't remember who put it forward, I just remember it, um, recommended a pastoral review saying, let's look at this, let's look as a church, and is this the right perspective for us to have, is this consistent with who we are as a church, and they, which led to the support for the current canon. So we have had, the, had this conversation, doesn't mean we can't continue to have it, it just means that that is something that um, we've gone through before. But this is here. Here's one of the important things. There is great pastoral latitude. We all know that there are a great number of churches, Trinity being one of them, that is very comfortable inviting people forward. Uh, the point is not to say we can't do that. The point is to not to change the canon that essentially establishes that relationship between baptism and the Eucharist. Um, Full, you know, basically, these open invitations happen all the time. There is not a single priest I know who has ever been drawn up on charges. We do not check, we do not check uh, uh, IDs at the rail. In fact, in many cases, uh, in many cases, I would say, you know, again, this is, this is uh, pastorally. In many cases, it's really appropriate in, depending on what church you're in, what the situation is, is to say, listen, we, you know, we want you, you know, we want... We want all people to be here. We want all people, to, we hope you'll come to be baptized. We want you to come forward, but to tie that to a conversation rooted in uh, our understanding of baptism and how that shapes our church. So questions about that before we kind of cruise on. Tony. Um, oh, thanks, Scott. My concern about the canons thing mm -hmm. is that um, if, the canon says mm -hmm. no unbaptized person shall be eligible to receive communion. And, and I say this out of the fact that we have seen this change in the, in the secular world. Mm -hmm. If the political winds shift, then what happens to churches who say you don't have to be baptized to receive communion. That's my concern about this issue. Mm -hmm. Aretha. Um, it's a little bit different, but I know, I know that this would have to go back to 1995. And my daughter had chosen someone to be a godparent to her son. Mm -hmm. And it was found out that that person was not baptized. Could you hold the microphone mm -hmm. closer to your mouth? <laughs> it was found that uh, the person my daughter chose to be godparent to her son was not baptized. So he was not allowed to be, she was not allowed to be a godparent. But the question came up because Baptism in her church is c the same as confirmation in our church. Mm. Oh, okay, I got you. Yep, 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 yep. But that, they wouldn't consider that at the time. Like I said, that was 1995. Right, yeah. I mean, uh, that, and Tony's question is, is certainly a fair one as well, which is where in that... We have a pretty loose understanding of godparents anyway. Um, it's, uh, that's, I mean, I think in a place like Trinity, currently I wouldn't really give that a lot of, I wouldn't spend a lot of time pastorally with that conversation. I mean, chances are, in terms of how we regard godparents anyway, that's not really a binding thing. That's not really, that was here. Okay, when, that was 94? 94. Okay. That's, I mean, also, that, you know, that's helpful to know, to, to look back on. And I think, Tony, that's a legitimate concern um, because we, we weigh against that possibility um, against the sense that um, we, no, that's not, I, I think I'll just leave it. That's a good question. <laughs> I'm like, ah! 
right, all of this, I mean, some of this, this is what comes. These are the questions that legitimately come from, if this is the emphasis we're putting it on, putting it on baptism, then what does that mean in terms of how we're, we're ordering our church? So I think it's a fair question. So why don't we move, and then, I mean, I, I, just to, because we've got a handful of things to talk about, and then we'll have time at the end to get that. Is that, is that okay? All right. I'm not even on the list yet. That was probably the one that, you know. All right. Who's excited about employee benefits, medical trust? Yeah, those of us who receive benefits, we are important. Uh, we, we, we are excited about it. Okay. So this, to me, this made my top 10 list because about 10 years ago, the Episcopal Church entered into an agreement with the Episcopal Church Medical Trust. I was just becoming a rector at the time. And they did some really good things, like they established polity between lay employees and clergy. Uh, they got us onto a healthcare system that was more consistent and, and just you know, really better across the board, except they did so in, from a sense of there's some, oh, we're going to get all of our churches together and we're going to have some savings. That did not happen. It was the opposite direction. It has been consistently more expensive than most market uh, healthcare situations outside of it, which is just really difficult for churches that, remember, most churches have been getting smaller over the last decade. Um, for that to be happening while healthcare costs are getting much higher, and imagine that you don't have an endowment. Imagine that you don't have the kind of resources that many ch that some churches have, which means that's been pretty difficult. I'm not saying we're moving away from this, but for, okay, first of all, a couple issues separate to that. Uniform paid family leave and uniform maternal disability coverage, forgive the misspelling there. Um, when, when Graham was born, Joe was working as a lay, part-time layperson for the nicest Episcopal church in town, uh, and she got two weeks off for maternity. Um, so we weren't happy about that. Uh, you know which church you are. I'm looking at the internet now. Um, <laughs> they're not watching. Um, this would, you know, this would say we can't, th that um, that could no longer happen. Um, would move for the Episcopal Church Medical Trust to cover infertility. Um, it would, so would allow dioceses to opt out of the medical trust. Oh, by the way, they the medical trust kind of dodged this. They, they um, have, so we, we've kind of gone back and saying this is something that we would like for you to cover. Um, but this means that dioceses would be able to opt out of the Episcopal Church Medical Trust. Um, so I'm not sure what the outcome of this would be. I don't know how well we've researched it. I hope we have. Uh, but I would say that some freedom to, to look at the best options may allow churches that are struggling financially um, to find a better option. No idea if that's in the best interest of the Diocese of Ohio or not. It just says this has basically been the vendor that our church has had for 10 years, and it's worked in some ways and hasn't worked in others. Gail Smith, this one's for you. Uh, 9.5, because I had to slip one in. Um, we're go setting a goal of net carbon neutrality by 2030, um, which means, and this is not binding for trinity or other churches we would ourselves could decide to follow along but this is for all those who fly to general convention this is for the people who work at 815 which is the building downtown so travel energy use building efficiencies and purchased offsets also um so this is about general convention not congregations but we could try to follow it we um and then it's creating an internal carbon offset program uh d27 Suggest greater utilization for virtual governance. Quick show of hands only for those who have done this before. Do we like virtual governance or do we need to be there in person? Two hands up. And that meh from Diane, that's probably an... Uh, if necessary. There, there are arguments to be said that so some of this stuff really you have, you do it better when you're in the room together. Right, But on the other hand, when you're holding a committee hearing and you want someone from um, uh, someone to, to report who may not be a part of that committee, they don't have to fly across the country. Right? So this, as it has been here at Trinity, there is greater access. Um, so social justice resolutions, there are a number of them that uh, I'm aware of. One, see, access to gender-affirming care for all ages. Um, that's very much in response to recent anti-trans um, legislation. 
Um, that is unanimously supported by bishops and deputies, which I think is important. Uh, call a resolution calling for health in, equity in health outcomes. So uh, gen, dealing with gender, dealing with race. Um, I don't know if that one addresses uh, access to reproductive health or not. We do have that already in existing resolutions. So I don't, yeah, I'm sure there are a number of new ones coming up. There are also, when something is, is put out there, it, it still stands until it's been addressed or taken out. So we have a number that are already out there. Um, 50, CO 54 expands voter registration and ballot access. By the way, what, what does A, B, C, and D mean? So um, it regards the originating source. You know, if you see a Congress bill um, described as S number, you know, it's coming from the Senate. Um, a, B, C, D indicates who has sent it in. Right. Um, so when a resolution comes from any sort of official Episcopal Church thing, be it a task force or a committee or um, executive council, or the presiding officers, um, who are the presiding bishop and the president of the House of Deputies. Um, a B resolution, as you could guess, comes from a bishop. And any resolution um, that's submitted by a bishop must have at least uh, two endorsers um, also who are bishops um, for it to get considered. Um, C resolutions come from dioceses and provinces. Um, for example, um, Ohio has sent ones in the past. Uh, BJ just mentioned a C1 that North Carolina sent back in 2012, I believe. Um, mm -hmm. And then D, all, as you might guess, comes from deputies. Um, again, a deputy has to have two endorsing deputies um, for it to be considered. For example, BJ talked uh, about DO27, the virtual governance one, which I am, one of my good friends is the author, and he asked me to endorse. Okay. So that is... That Wait, are you getting like a shoebox of twenties or free communion for a year to endorse it? No, he's no, he he's a layman, so I don't get anything that special. But I, I do agree with that. Um, he's not a priest. Um, I will remain mum on what I'm getting for uh, my liturgy review for my uh, for my anti-Semitism liturgical uh, resolution. No comment. All right. Okay. Um, where are we? 50, CO 54, so that is from, um, that's going to be from a diocese, is that right? Okay. Uh, expands voter access. Um, CO 27 would affirm nuclear disarmament. DO 13, lift every voice and sing as the national hymn of the United States, which we just sung. Um, so I don't know what that means. I mean, obviously, we can use it already. Um, but it's just, it affirms it in a different way. It's, the, it's to support the congressional resolution that Jim Clyburn introduced. Okay. That's a terrible idea. Huh? Oh, I'm... Let's talk later about that, Tony. Yeah. Okay. Uh, D31, more forceful stance around how we process migrants as a country. And then D54... Um, so would suggest moving General Convention 2024 from Louisville uh, because at the time they stood out in terms of, I can't remember which, basically from any jurisdiction that limits the rights of its citizens. Um, problems with that, that actually is a pretty controversial one. Uh, well, the thing... Well, okay, there's two, there's two issues. Yes, that's exactly right. How are we deciding what, you know, what rights are being, you know, who, which governments are limiting which rights? And what often happens is you sort of have kind of coastal dioceses calling out the dioceses that are in places that, um, you know, the South or the Midwest. And it's not necessarily the Episcopalians who are leading that charge, right? Um, so now, of course, we're all in a place, you know, to Bob's point, 
And so this is why there's a lot of vigorous conversation around that. Like, is this the wet, best way, you know, by essentially not having our convention in? Now, there could be situations, you know, extreme situations. I can't, you know, I was in North Carolina when they had the anti-trans legislation and the bathroom bill. So the all-star game did not come. Clearly, there was something significant major making putting that on the news. So just to, I put this up to you to let you know the type of things that are up there, but also say the type of pushback that, that happens, why, why this is, is kind of a slam dunk and this is a controversial one. Another good Christian thought process for people who go to Another th accept other people's values. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Right, right. Uh, someday I hope to have some failures of my own, but in the meantime. Um, all right. So I think you cannot, you, the story of the Episcopal Church, you, we do have to tell not only for some really great work that we're doing in the areas of recon, racial reconciliation, uh, that in terms of, um, I think there's a great spiritual vitality in the Episcopal Church, but we also have to name the fact that numerically we are a shrinking church in many, many ways. This is a process that is not new. This is a process that has been happening for decades. The pandemic certainly advanced it. And I think part of what we see are some resolutions that address that or at least acknowledge the reality of it. So one, for example, again, these are not like the hottest resolutions uh, at the top of the list, but I think they tell a story. Um, one would allow dioceses to merge where there is not a sitting bishop. So over the last few years, we've seen a few sets of dioceses merge. And the point is, I guess the current canon say you have to have a sitting bishop in order to merge a diocese. Well, they're suggesting that sometimes when bishops, dioceses are without bishops, that's the best time to do it. It, it probably takes a lot, you know, sometimes to do that around a bishop who doesn't want to, uh, doesn't want to you know, do that is probably a challenging thing to do. Although... I think oftentimes bishops are going to be the ones who recognize this is an unmanageable diocese because it's, it's too large, there aren't enough clergy, you name it. So it just allows for that option. And then A139 means that we would have the General Seminary in New York City affiliate with the Virginia Theological Seminary. So the General Seminary in New York, which is also the only one bound by convention, um, it is in a pretty tight spot. It has been for a number of years, uh, but in terms of their, you know, their sources of revenue, um, the pandemic did nothing to, to help what was already a pretty tricky situation. So the question becomes, uh, do you close? Do you sell off the bill, sell off the assets? This is a possibility where they essentially fill, affiliate with the Virginia Theological Seminary. There are a couple of seminaries that are doing fine financially. The, Episcopal, the Virginia Theological Seminary is one of them. This is not brand new. Um, in the 1970s, the Pusey Report looked at the, this, you know, where things were in the Episcopal Church, saw that this type of thing was going to be happening, and recommended that eventually we were going to go from 11 seminaries to five. Um, and the general seminary, I think, being obviously in New York, New York City where it is, there's a certain identity piece of it. Um, you know, to, to not have that would be a loss to the church. Um, at the same time, this is an acknowledgement that some things are going to have to change because for many years they've been trying to uh, find a more stable financial model. I'm going to skip that next one. It's not that interesting. <laughs> Uh oh no, I won't. It doesn't want to hit the button. So, all right, I'll just go ahead and say it. Um, one resolution that would allow lay, pe lay persons or priests that are currently on general convention committees, if their ontological status changed, uh, meaning a lay person becomes a bishop, uh, a priest, or a priest becomes a bishop. So, if if you know if Adrian were on the the uh, SCLM, which is the liturgy and music one. Adrian gets elected to be the bishop of, what diocese do you want to be the bishop of? <laughs> Our new diocese on planet Mars, Hawaii. Hawaii. <laughs> could, this would suggest that, that she could remain on as a bishop, right? And, and the pushback to this 
would be to say, actually, we, by, we, one way to honor the particular gifts of all orders is to say, Adrian has new places to lead in the church. We need to bring in another layperson. So just to, I give that, again, to get a sense of how we think about the types of things that Episcopalians fight about late at night. Um, <laughs> all right, now, all right, lesser feasts and fasts. Um, there has been great drama over the last five or six years around our calendar of saints. Uh, lesser feasts and fasts is the standard that we have. It's often what you we have. Uh, so if you come to Evensong uh, on a Wednesday night, we celebrate the propers of a particular saint. Uh, a handful of years ago, a new text was introduced, Holy Women, Holy Men, which vastly expanded the, the canon of saints that we have. Trinity has been using that often. Um, I, I think the push, there's pushback in a few ways. I think one, it was so sprawling, it was difficult for some to follow. It also had a number of people who, as wonderful as they were, were not Christians or had not been baptized, which, which is kind of the same thing. But, but the point is, again, it goes back to that question of our baptismal ecclesiology that we don't canonize, by the way. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about understanding um, those commemorations as being examples of holy lives of people who lived out their baptismal, uh, lived out their baptisms in a particular and special way. That's kind of the understanding to that. There was, uh, an the next text was a great cloud of witnesses. I'm not Richard, why was that uh, deemed a turkey? Uh, yeah. That it was a great cloud of witnesses was killed in 2018 because people thought that it created two classes of saints. Okay. That, sorry, two classes of saints. So that lesser people thought that basically what we were doing is what we were saying that the, the, the saints and the feasts and celebrations held in lesser feasts and fasts would be treated as more important than those in Great Cloud of Witnesses. Got it. Okay. Um, which, I mean, there is a hierarchy to some extent, but not to that level, I not think. Not at that, right. Um, and, and we'll, I'll talk a little bit about, there are kind of two lists of saints that we're going to be keeping. But, boy, I'm glad you're here, Richard. I couldn't quite find the exact name. Um, so what, this do, what we would do is affirm or approve Lesser Feast and Fast 2018, or maybe someone will go really rogue and call it Lesser Feasts and Fast 2022. Okay, so they're doing that, which basically greatly follows in this path of greatly expanding the canon of people who we commemorate. Um, but returning to kind of the, so I'm, but also establishes revision principles, which we've kind of been living into, but this would essentially affirm uh, how is it that we decide who is in the book of saints, right? Who is in, which I think is a fascinating process. Um, so basically, we're moving from lesser feasts and fasts. We've been through these other texts. We're going back to lesser feasts and fasts, but it's a more expanded lesser feasts and fasts. So there are actually nine revision principles, uh, but I condensed it a little bit. So one, historicity and significance. So Gandalf would not be eligible, right? <laughs> Gandalf did not exist. He's a wonderful human being. But that is not actually something that happened in the real world. Um, significance. Okay, Gandalf was significant, but obviously. But you, you want, we're looking for people whose life stories uh, hold a greater meaning that help us understand what it means to be Christian, right? To, and oftentimes these are heroic examples uh, that we look to to help us how do we live out this life that we're called to? Um, so two is Christian discipleship. We look to people within these commemorations uh, in terms of how did they live out their baptism? How did they build up the body of Christ? Um, range of inclusion. That is an intentional look at how are we expanding um, our view of what the body of Christ looks like. And by doing this, this helps to give us tangible examples of what this looks like and to reveal that this is a greater diversity than perhaps many of us grew up understanding. So this is one of the places where we expand our view of like, what does it mean to be followers of Jesus? What, is it, what does it look like? Who do we look like? 
local organic observance. That means it is not normative for us to say, um, we at the General Convention have decided that we think that Gail Smith needs, to com needs a commemoration, and we are now going to have all of the diocese come up with commemorations and report back. It is, it is preferred that it comes from local observance, so that we begin our observance of Gale. Um, you can pick your propers, let us know. Uh, and, and we gather on occasion to talk about it. And then perhaps it grows to other dioceses. And we all realize that this is something that's kind of happening organically. And that the Episcopal, you know, the convention recognizes that and says, there's something here. We should draw this in, in, in how into our, our sanctoral calendar. And then finally, perspective, which means it's ideal, though not always, for us to say that we would not do this for someone who, has it, who, um, who is less than 50 years has passed away. Excuse me, who has 50 years or two generations after that person's death. So unless I do something really good, like get a Nobel Peace Prize next Tuesday, you're not going to be doing any, uh, I'm not making this book for a long time, <laughs> right? Richard, and I will get to some examples of how we're not, how, how we're going to break that rule potentially at this oh, convention. Yeah. Well, actually, I was, were you, in, have you read about the most recent legislative committee hearing from last week? Because I was. Um, so they slightly, I was in the legislative committee hearing on this uh, last Monday. Mm -hmm. And so they have slightly changed perspective. 50 years is the normative. Okay. But the current rule, the, the rule that will hopefully be adopted is that two general conventions must pass in between the time of the person's death and when they are first considered for the calendar. Um, so from 50 years to six. Well, and that's, it, it is still normative 50 years, oh, but okay. that... It, at minimum, it must be six plus years okay. um, in special circumstances, and that's up to individuals, uh, you know, to decide. I I normally lean towards great. I mean, not even greatness, but like martyrdom is normally like the one thing that I'll be like, yeah, okay, fine. That's you know that that is a pretty definite Christian witness right there. Okay. Um, and you know some modern martyrs like Matthew Shepard, who's being right. debated right. Uh, for addition this year. So we'll talk. I'm going to get to that too. So I'll talk. Uh, we'll see some practical examples of how we're talking about that right now. Um, oh, as well as some guidelines for how you do a grassroots uh, commemoration. So actually, Gail, you don't have to suggest propers. We're coming up with them for you. <laughs> We do, yes, we do. <laughs> the improper propers. Okay, uh, so the book of occasional, a little bit of a book of common prayer, housekeeping, and the book of occasional services. So there is a red book from which I have things like um, a house blessing. I think the foot washing is in the, the book of occasional services. It's a, it is an approved liturgical resource that I will use that has things that just aren't regular enough to be in the book of common prayer. So uh, I'll get to that in a second. We, you'll, you may have noticed that we have an expansive language version of A, B, and D. We'll be adding one to C. That has to do with the fact that all that happened kind of fast at the last convention, and they didn't feel like what they had ready to go for prayer C was quite ready. So that will be added. This will have a revision to the Book of Occasional Services. Things like the foot washing will be less pre-centric. This adds a quinceanera. Um, has a service for when a person leaves a congregation. Um, great many, a great list of things that you know we can get into another time. But basically, it updates the Book of Occasional Services. There are some proposed revisions to the Holy Week lectionary, specifically having to do with um, Good Friday and concerns that the the of anti-Semitism that comes as a result of that. It's the service as a whole. It's the service as a whole. Yeah, that's my resolution. The one that I'm going to make comments to about potentially being bribed for. Oh, okay. There you go. Yeah. Uh, so full on. Um, so I am. Uh, I am the sponsor of the of Resolution D O six eight, um, which is a proposed revision to the Good Friday services and the Good Friday lectionary, to remove uh, anti-Semitic canards uh, mm. 
from it. Um, the current plan is that it'll be referred to an interim body for the next two years, but I will be doing some talking with some of my fellow deputies who are, uh, including Rosalind Hughes, who's the chair of our Austin Liturgical Commission, about getting that authorized for use here in this diocese uh, for next year so that we can fully be more inclusive and just be better about our discussions and how we talk about our Jewish neighbors. So an example of, and, and I, would, I would say both in terms of the process there is important because I, I haven't read that resolution, but I think there are a handful of resolutions and it would probably be referred to an interim body or to SCLM so that those who have some, a little bit of a wider perspective, and that's not, you know, that's not a shade on Richard, but rather so that, I didn't write it. I'm right, my point is that convention is not going to be writing liturgy. Um, that when there's an important idea, it gets referred out for, um, and then, but some of those could be made available as, um, uh, as, as, as authorized uses. Because that's an example of there are different perspectives on how best to manage that liturgy. So some would like it to be the, the good, litur- good Friday Liturgy to simply change some of that language. Some go a bit farther to say we actually have a part in the Good Friday Liturgy where we repent of anti-Semitism, which is a different per- path, right? So how do we filter all of those while also finding ways to integrate some of those uses? I was, you know, I would love to have something a little different to use on Good Friday. I don't. What's that? Yeah, send it to me. So, okay, and then oh, this is exciting. Write one will be available in write two language. Um, so, if if it if it gets passed, because there are some pieces to write one that we didn't carry over, and people really miss that. Um, and so that's a possibility. And there's an interesting one about clarifying clergy obligation to adherence of things that are in the Book of Occasional Services. Um, so. Just to remember, there are all those rubrics, and yes, I did take a vow, we priests do take a vow to support everything that the Episcopal Church says and does, but there's obviously kind of a gray area in some of this stuff, like I'm not going to get fired for doing the foot washing wrong, right? I mean, that's, that's just not going to happen. Um, but so that's the question, like what, is, what happens in, in this book of occasional services? What, what, are our, what are we expecting our priests to do? And actually, it's a great example. I mean, let's talk about, I mean, it, it takes us back to the question of inviting people to communion without having taken baptism. Yes, you could say that I'm violating my vows to do that, but in reality, it's fine, right? We all kind of realize that in, that's kind of where we are right now. Um, so there is some gray area in a lot of this that is, but there is some structure kind of in the background. This is, I think, pretty exciting. Um, so new commemorations. So th- this is getting to the lesser feast and fast, the sort of saint commemorations. One, uh, this would give Harriet Tubman her own day. Right now, she's a part of, there are, there are four other people, uh, Sojourner Truth, and forgive me, I'm spacing out on who the other two, that she's, is it Susan B. Anthony? Is she one of them? Okay, so there. So this would give Harriet Tubman her own her own day. Uh, COO four would be inclusion of Juneteenth, so it would be similar to Independence Day. As you know, I read the colic for Independence Day today. I did not use the propers for Independence Day today. Right, that that is not something I'm able to do. I would not replace a Sunday propers with any of these saints' days. Um, nor if it, if Independence Day stood on the on a sunday i wouldn't have done that right because because that's it's secondary to the however fourth it, it does have its own collect in our list of of seasonal collects so it's of the there is some significance so this would include juneteenth i think there have been a number of affirming resolutions saying we do want to do this um uh, co3 well you, william porcher de Bose, He was contemporary with slavery. He did not renounce slavery at any point. Times five means there are five dioceses uh, or five resolutions asking for this. The argument being obvious, but the argument is also is we realize that, yes, we all exist in a time period and we're often blind to things that are very wrong, but sometimes we're not. And that is a pretty clear, uh, so that is not 
if saints are, are, are celebrating how people lived out their baptismal lives, how can we celebrate someone who did not affirm, sla who, who, who didn't um, renounce slavery and say that that was living out their baptismal commitments? We, we, we really don't feel that we can. So CO19 would do a commemoration for John Lewis. So first question might come to mind uh, is perspective, right? Um, which is, he's obviously, he only passed away a couple years ago. And yet, let's look at his life story, right? Not only is it incredibly current right now, he was a Christian minister whose, who, you know, good trouble was rooted in his experience of the gospel. So it's a really kind of great question, which I suspect, you know, as Richard mentioned, they're looking at that. Maybe, maybe 50 years is too long. Maybe we need to look at this a little bit sooner. Um, okay, this is like the no-brainer of all convention, right? Howard Thurman should be... So, you know, there. And I'll point out, I hadn't read Howard Thurman until a few years ago. Um, and that is, is, is that a, uh, a gap in my experience? And not? Yes, it certainly is. But, well, it is. But my point is the fact that it's not necessarily on the radar. I'm sure it is by now. I mean, it's been a handful of years ago since I was in seminary, but I didn't find my way to it. So let's make sure that it is more visible in the church. Uh, and make sure that he's more visible. He clearly has had a profound impact uh, on uh, our church, certainly our country in the 20th century. Um, okay, Barbara Clementine Harris, first African-American woman bishop in the, in, the, in the country, only died a couple years ago. Um, 17 resolutions supporting uh, Bishop Barbara. Uh, so I, I suspect that means it's likely to happen. I, I don't know. What's that? Did they all get referred? Okay, so there's clearly kind of a movement. Um, but this uh, CO23, the third or fourth Sunday of Advent, which would make the third or fourth Sunday of Advent a uh, Sunday of Thanksgiving for the abolition of slavery and uh, a celebration that black lives matter. Um, this will, I would guess, this is going to be a challenging one to pass. First of all, Juneteenth probably will pass, I would imagine. This also, we don't do a lot of commemoration in seasons like Advent. Um, so that would certainly be something that is without much precedent. Um, so I have no idea what the likelihood of that one is, um, but I give it to just a sense of what some of the commemorations are. Did it also get referred? Every, everything on this list about the sanctoral calendar got referred to SCLM. Okay, um, so they won't vote on it this year? They'll sort of take a look at it? Yeah, my... my I can't check because the, the V binder's down right now, but uh, my, I, I believe everything on here is getting referred to SCLM okay. uh, for us to look at their report for 2024. Okay. Um, so, and then Matthew Shepard is also going to be referred, but a gay man who was martyred um, about 15 years ago? Who is, who is, what's that? The 20 years? As long as, but he, he is buried at, um, at National Cathedral. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to tell you something. This was probably one of my favorites. It's probably not going to excite you, but <laughs> AO99 would increase the research capacity of the Episcopal Church. There was a guy. There was a researcher uh, who, in 2015, put out an incredible resource called New Facts on Growth. And, and what this was, and this, uh, for those of us who picked it up and, and put it to use, it was pretty remarkable. What it did was it, did stu it studied the whole church. And it didn't say, this is what works and this is what didn't. What it said was, this is what we are seeing in different regions of the country, in different situations. And churches that are doing, churches that are growing are likely to be doing this. And churches that are declining are likely to be doing this. And some of that is churches that are growing are likely to be in the south. Churches that are not growing are likely to be in the northeast. So we can't get past that. But it also did things like churches. It didn't get into, um, you know, where it started. Churches with a vision for who they are are likely to be growing, right? Didn't get, in, didn't get into what that vision was. But if they were clear, then they were likely to be. Churches that were growing... Uh, were likely to be comfortable with change. Didn't matter what that change was. Churches that, um, unfortunately, had things like 
Churches with clergy of, if you had less than a full-time clergy, were not likely to be growing. Churches with clergy of a certain age or a certain tenure were not likely to be growing. Didn't mean that that was absolute. It just meant, you know, by paying attention to some of those patterns, you see some things that are working. To me, oh, churches that had multiple services were likely to be growing. Churches that had drums were likely to be growing. <laughs> Seriously. Seriously, because they recognized that people often had different needs, and that would mean it would be a different sound. So churches, they were able to offer multiple expressions. That's one of the reasons why I, I want us to see the Abundant Table service. I want to see that thrive, because I think we need to have multiple expressions on a Sunday morning, and, and partly just because the data tells us that's what we need to do, but more to the point it's more a better expression of who we are. Um, churches, this is really helpful. Um, churches don't necessarily, that are growing, don't necessarily have a vast children's ministry program, but they have something. I, listen to why that matters, right? Most churches don't have the resources to, to bring Eric Travis in, right? Um, and you have this pressure of like, oh, I can't have 14 classrooms. I can never grow a children's ministry. That's actually not what you need. You simply need to have a good, solid, visible presence, and you can actually grow from that. So there's a lot of freedom that that gave us if we kind of paid attention. So why does that matter? Because that guy retired, and we never hired anybody else. <laughs> So after 2015, that research stopped. So this would cre uh, create, put forward $450,000 for a new researcher that helps us to look carefully at the patterns, which I also think, especially after the pandemic, we need this information. Um, sometimes we say, I, I think that it, there is often information that can really help us if we take a look at it. Um, it's not always the flashiest, it's not always the most exciting, but it goes towards helping our congregations, our cathedrals, our dioceses to be as healthy as possible. Okay, um, this is something pretty new. I just added this in in the last few days. Uh, A125 would create the Episcopal Coalition for Racial Equity and Justice. Um, this is a voluntary association of dioceses, parishes, and, you know, cathedrals, whoever, dedicated to becoming the beloved community. It would support the effort uh, to gather to support efforts to dismantle white supremacy and work towards racial justice. It means the presiding bishop and our future House of, bishop, bishop, House of Deputies president would appoint a commission um, to help support this. It would be funded with a tenth of the endowment draw available from the Episcopal Church's budget, so that would be 0.05% and would create an independent reparations fund commission. Uh, I don't have much information beyond that in terms of what that would look like, but it's obviously, it's a, in, it's a structural and financial commitment to being the beloved com becoming the beloved community and to the work of anti-racism. And then A127 would seek 2.5 million for a fact-finding commission to explore and publicize the church's involvement in indigenous boarding schools. All right, I talked too much early, and I'm running out of time. Just we're getting the good stuff. Um, it's really all good stuff. Um, two, EpiscopalCommonPrayer.org. So this is a step towards revision that also makes new resources available today. So the Standing Commission on Liturgy and Music is the one that oversees all of our liturgical revision. Uh, they they, um, they're the ones to whom I think a lot of these are being referred to. In 2018, there was a lot of conversation. Do we, do we revise a new prayer book? What's our new direction? What they did was to keep the 1979 prayer book as, as the structure, but they, incur they created something brand new and exciting called the Task Force for Liturgical and Prayer Book Revision. There is great controversy in our church right now about whether this is pronounced tiffle fibber or tooful poober. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you how to think. <laughs> tooful poober. I think tooful poober is far funnier. Um, but so they did their last year when we did, um, uh, when we did community conversations around liturgy, what 
Adrian and I used was the work that this commission had created, which allowed us to, one, we're looking to magnify our language for God and for the people of God, um, but not erase the language that we've had in the past. Uh, but uh, help to uh, give us some structures like, all right, what is, what is our liturgy? What, mean, what does it mean to be Anglican? What does it mean? What's at the root of it? Um, and they also, along the way, created this thing called EpiscopalCommonPrayer.org, which is a website that's one-stop shopping that allows you to go and see, okay, what has been, um, what has been authorized? So the prayer book, obviously, authorized. Book of Occasional Services, authorized. Uh, enriching our worship, which we often use here, authorized. But also authorized for trial use, which means we can just use it anytime without consulting our bishop. Uh, and then there are other things that we could use, like what um, I suspect that what Richard was suggesting we would probably need to check with Bishop Hollingsworth. That's part of how we Episcopalians understand the liturgical process. And through that, we put it into use and we see how it, how it works. So the point is, this is a step towards a larger view of the Episcopal Church tradition, the Book of Common Prayer tradition, which integrates multiple available resources while putting it online so that I, when I'm planning a liturgy, can go and find it pretty simply. I can know what I'm allowed to use. I can know what I need to ask permission to use. Uh, and I also, it actually helps just for planning to quickly say, I need a PDF of the baptism liturgy. Click, I go straight to that. So um, this, the, basically, the, this EpiscopalCommonPrayer.org, which was created by Tiffle Fibber, Tufel Puber, uh, now has been handed over to the SCLM and to the church. So essentially the Episcopal Church now owns this. So it is a resource that is no longer a temporary resource. It's one we keep using. Yes, sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, EpiscopalCommonPrayer.org. Check it out. Um, I use it often. Uh, and then it continues the work of Tufel Fuber, Tiffel Paber, Taba Pabubu. Um, and then... Finally, prayer book revision, prayer pre-work. Where are we in this conversation around prayer book revision? I'm not sure. I don't know. But there's clearly some work happening that would allow us to continue that. One, we talked about the we talked about the canon the um, the saints calendars. Well, one place there there are so many saints now that we're looking at. That's a good thing. One place they're going to create two lists, one that looks at saints from the more or less from the apostolic age, which will go in the prayer book when there is a new prayer book in the calendar in the front, and then one that is more expansive, and that will be the book of lesser feasts and fasts. So what you see there is they're thinking ahead to a new prayer book as they're creating that list. Um, and then AO60, Guidelines for Expansive Inclusive liturgy language so that is clearly a part of our conversation as well which is what are our guidelines what are our priorities and our values around expansive and inclusive language a126 a comprehensive review of our 1982 hymnal for racist colonialist white supremacist and imperial language so the point here we are they likely to to completely dig into a new prayer book in a seven-day convention they are not they are not. Um, and, and really, to me, the question, you know, I think the question that often comes up is, the 79 prayer book was pretty revolutionary in its own right. Um, the question, and I don't think there's one answer, is, are we ready to move on to it? Have we fully lived into it? Um, there's a lot of conversation to be had about what it can teach us, why it was special in the moment, why it's special today, but also acknowledging in many ways the language does become dated. We know there's a lot more in our conversation about language for God, language for the people of God that ought to be a part of our conversation as well. So all of that is sort of there. These are my top 10. Uh, yes, Richard, I welcome questions at this point. Oh, this isn't a question. It's a clarification of sort of right. what's going on next with the prayer book. Um, because this is good, but you probably see the words prayer book revision and freak out a little, um, because I do. So there are two proposals um, right now. So currently we have the prayer book. It's a physical book. We all know it and we love it mostly. Um, the, the proposal that came from Tefl Pibber was that anything that passes, that, that gets approval from two consecutive general conventions becomes part of the prayer book. And it goes on EpiscopalCommonPrayer.org. And we basically have this 
theoretically infinite prayer book in the cloud. Um, and then there's a proposal. I'm reaching for oxygen. Yes. And then there's... I mean, that's good. And also yeah. like, ah! No. And then there's another proposal by um, Bishop Provenzano of Long Island is the author of it. Um, and it would basically sort of create... I'm Full disclosure, I'm a supporter of it. Um, it would create a hierarchy um, to our liturgical book. So it would be the prayer book, which we define now as the red book. Um, supplementary liturgical... Um, text that includes things like enriching our worship um the and then um sort of other books like the book of occasional services which you don't need to use every sunday um as well as lesser feasts and fasts and um so that's kind of where that is i it's going to have a lot of uh discussion and debate on the floor i can guarantee that but um it's going to be really interesting to see what happens uh with all of that. Great. And I think part of one thing that I think should be noted is that there's also a movement on, you know, BJ mentioned it with having right one go into right two language. Uh, there's a pretty significant movement of people who want to sort of set guidelines for how we can use existing texts, but make them expansive and inclusive. Um, and so hopefully we'll get some more on that in the coming uh, week. So we're, we're at an hour, but there may be questions. So if people have to scoot, we understand. But uh, if people have questions about any of these things or any of the thousand resolutions I didn't get to, there's a good chance I won't have an answer. But yeah, Richard might. Go for it, Diane. Um, I just wanted to say that part of the convention is going to be a consent calendar. So some of the resolutions that are really not being contested will all get put into that and it'll all be accepted like in a big, there's a very large consent calendar this okay, year. Okay, I'll bet there is. For times to save time. Can someone like, I want to pull that out of consent and put it on the table? Or yes. is there kind of an agreement that that's not going to happen much? or? or Right. But the House has to vote, and at least one third of all deputies have to agree to pull it off. Okay. Okay. So just, yeah, just okay. that. And I guess the, on the prayer book revision, some of this is because of um, same sex marriages. There aren't words to describe right. some of that. So there are expansions of our faith that are not included in our worship sometimes that are being addressed. So. Yes. I cruised pretty fast, and we didn't stop for a lot of questions, so what's that? All right. Thank you all very much. Pray for our general convention. Pray for our delegates. Pray for the pigeons on the floor. And, uh, and, and if you have questions and thoughts, by all means, send them my way. I appreciate the conversation. Thank you. All right.